Leah Klett here with the Christian Post, and I'm so excited to be here today with Lisa Bevere. Lisa and her husband, John, lead Messenger International. She's also a best-selling author, and her latest book is called Fiercely Loved. Just love this title. It's such a pretty book, too. And I Thank you. You know I'm dressed to sort of match. I see so. that. <laughs> yes. But I love this title because it just, it just feels like a hug. So I want to hear from you where this title came from and why you wrote this book. So, well, first of all, I love that you love the title. I felt like people feel fiercely judged. And so I had to do the antithesis of that. And I think a lot of people don't understand that God is not dispassionate towards us. He is emotionally engaged. He cares, he loves, he's present. And again, you know, people don't, I think people kind of have this mindset of, well, God has to love me mm -hmm. because of Jesus. He probably doesn't really want to love me because I'm a horrible person, but he has to love me. And that is just not true. We seem to have forgotten that it was God who sent his son to express his heart. It wasn't like Jesus came and said, wait, 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 don't be mad at them. You know, they're idiots. Please forgive them. He actually came to express the will of the father and, and to actually personify this love that was so fierce that it would die to bring back into relationship the objects of its affection. And, you know, I am a, um, I am not only a grandmother, I am Sicilian. So everything in our life is pretty fierce. I mean, we eat fierce, we fight fierce, we do games fierce. Everything is passionate in our world, in our family. And I, I look at how God describes himself as basically this, fierce protector, this fierce pursuer, this fierce lover. And I, I just feel like it just doesn't translate a lot. When people say, oh yeah, I know God loves me. I know God loves me. It's, it's, it's like white noise to them. Yeah. And so I had to put some kind of adjective attaching it to it so that people understood it was more than just white noise. Because if you think that God's love for you is just, yeah it's, yeah, it's old news, you have not experienced it. You know about it, but you haven't experienced it. And, you know, Leah, I was a complete heathen. You said you follow me on Instagram, so you would know a little bit about me. I was a complete heathen. I did not have any righteousness that I could bring to God. And there's a lot of people that live great lives and then they become a Christian. That was not me. I, I had brought nothing, and yet I experienced this love that consumed everything that was trying to unmake me. And uh, I feel like David, more than anybody, had a revelation and understanding of this when he wrote Psalm 139, and he said that God's love was basically innumerable, constant, and that it was treasure. So like when God looks at us, he says, how precious are your thoughts towards me? And, and that's how God looks at each and every one of us. He said, if I could number them, they would outnumber the sands on this, the seashores. And then he said, and when I wake, you are still there with me. And I just think too, too many people don't have this awareness of God's love for them. What is at the root of this disconnect? You know, why, why don't we fully understand God's love for us when this is sort of, we're, we're told this every single week at church, why, why this disconnect? Well, I think we can go to bed free and wake up a Pharisee. I don't know how it happens that fast. And I do think religion comes in and it's a God who loves us in spite of us. And then we try to earn it. And, and, all of us know <clears throat> that we cannot earn it. If we could have earned it, then he shouldn't have sent his son to die for us. So God already knows we're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. And that's not a justification or even permission to just be casual with it. Because I don't think that we should be casual. But I, I do think somewhere along the lines, we start to make it about us instead of about him. And, and so I think we start to begin to concentrate on our smallness instead of on his largeness. 
and the largest of God, the, the God who has loved us, has, past tense, loved us with an everlasting love, a love that cannot ever end and had actually no beginning. And, you know, I just think we don't pause. Mm -hmm. you, you, you even look at the Psalms and it's, you know, there's these beautiful declarations of who God is. And then it's a Selah. And, and that's a pause and ponder. We do not live in a day of pause and ponder. We do not live in a day of sacred spaces. We do not live in a day where we actually just recognize God's love for us in everything that we see. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in a conversation yesterday with my editor and we were talking about how God speaks to people. And, you know, there's a lot of people that think, well, God doesn't talk anymore except for through the scriptures. And I said, when you think that, that is the only place he will speak to you because he's not going to, you know, shock you in another realm. But I believe that God speaks through the scriptures. I believe that, you know, I've got some orchids behind me right there. Um, I believe I can actually put an orchid in the sunlight and you look at its petals and it's just sparkles. And when I look at that, I immediately experience the awe and the wonder of God, like, wait a minute, this petal in the sunlight just glows. So I feel like creation declares the existence and the wonder of God. Mm -hmm. I believe that you and I are talking and as we're talking, we're fellowshipping and, and the Holy Spirit is speaking one to another. I believe that leaders can call us or people that we love and trust can have a voice into us. And God speaks through people that we know and we trust, meaning not trolls. Uh, and, and then, you know, so God is always going to be speaking. There's times that the Holy Spirit will whisper. And, and I think that was the moment we were talking about because when I first became a Christian, again, you know, in awe, in awe of God's love for me, mm -hmm. absolutely in awe, then wanting to surrender my life to do a work for him, for him. And I had to come to the place that he had to say to me, Lisa, who you are to me is more important than anything you will do for me. He said, you are first and foremost, my daughter. And I'm 60, how old am I now? 62, I'm 62. And I still feel when I'm in prayer that God speaks to me as a daughter. He never says wife of John Bevere. He never says mother of four sons. He never says grandmother of almost six. He never says author, speaker. He says daughter. Mm -hmm. And that relational connection is so important. And too many people get so busy doing things for God, they neglect to do it with him. Yeah, yeah. Now, if we had a proper understanding of how much and how profoundly God loves us, how would our lives look different? How would our parenting look different? How would the way that we, um, you know, talk on social media look different? Well, first of all, we would respond with love. When I receive love, I can give love. If I feel judged, I'm going to judge. If I feel shame, I'm going to shame other people. If I feel blamed, I'm going to make excuses for myself. So when you receive the love of God for you, for you, then you actually have a capacity to love others. And, and that's why God's like, you shall love the Lord your God with all your might, your, all your heart, all your strength, you know, and I, different versions say all of your understanding. So like we love him and he loves us. And as I pursue God, I actually become more who I really am. So when I have received the love of God and somebody does something hateful to me, I'm going to respond with love. Jesus said, you bless those that curse you. You do good to those who have despitefully used and abused you. And when I say that, I'm not saying you put yourself in a place to be abused. I am saying that you can actually bless from a distance. You can, you can do good from a distance. Um, it says that if they slap you on one cheek, you're not supposed to slap them back. Yeah. You're supposed to turn the other cheek. I also, I mean, just even looking, you know, let's just be uh, aware of where we are right now. We've seen... Roe v. Wade overturned. And I've watched as Christians, 
are attacking each other. Yeah. Either you don't say enough or you didn't say enough soon enough, or I don't like what you said. I'm like, what in the world? Does the body of Christ have an autoimmune disease where we're just going to attack ourselves? Because right now I don't see people actually being able to look at the body of Christ and say, oh, we're going to know about Jesus because they love each other so well. Mm -hmm. So I don't see people who have received the love of God. I see people who have somehow turned into Pharisees who are actually looking for reasons to exclude or discount other people rather than love because love calls us higher and love believes the best. And it, I mean, like, if you just go through a whole Corinthians, you know, love believes the best, hopes for the best. It doesn't believe the worst. It does. It's not suspicious. It's not fearful. And so right now, when I have a settledness that God loves me, then I can actually be kind to other people who are cruel to me. Yeah. And kindness is not an endorsement. Kindness is actually what leads a lot of people to repentance. Mm. Lisa, how can we practice wisdom when it comes to what we post on social media? Um, I think there is sort of this inclination to just get on there and then sort of back up. It's easy, right, to be a keyboard warrior, but what are, what, what are some practical tools we can use before we post on social media? There are so many, Leah, so many brilliant posts I feel like I have that I type out, look at it, lift it up to the Lord. And he says, delete it, yeah. <laughs> just delete. I'm like, but do you like it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I have learned that first and foremost, there's, there's multiple levels of relationship. You don't know who you're talking to on social media. And if you don't really know who you're talking to, you need to be very aware of what you say. Mm. I don't necessarily no, I, there's, it would be impossible for me to know the pain they're going through, the anger, their experiences, you know, or if they're even a real person or just somebody trying to stir up strife. So what I have found is you will never be able to navigate social media well if you have it in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So we need to say, all right, who is the most deserving of my emotional energy? Those are the people I see, my husband, my children, my friends, then the next tier is going to be those that I can touch, those that I can reach my neighbors. If you see your brother in need, you see your neighbor in need, those are the people, the next. The people on this, they should not be allowed the same access as my family. And I think we've all learned this the hard way. I, you know, I remember, you know, many nights being like, my husband would be like, are you coming to bed? I'm like, wait, just a minute. And I'd be like trying to, to settle an argument. And then I realized some people don't even want, like they just want to argue. So the Bible says first and foremost, that the children of God, the servants of the Lord must not strive. It also says in as much as it is in your power, live at peace with all men, men, women, whatever, people on social media. It also says, I'm gonna give an account for every idle word that I speak. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give an account for the words that I post, that I speak, that I write, that I preach, because words are powerful. They can heal and they can wound. They can alienate and they can bring people back together, restoring breaches. So, I mean, restoring uh, relationships. And so I need to be slow to post, mm -hmm. quick to listen. You know, recently, um, um, you know, when, when Roe v. Wade was uh, overturned, I celebrated on the post of a beautiful friend of mine, the live action organization. I said, you know, well done or something, because they've always been winsome and kind with, with their pro-life approach. And a young girl who was obviously upset said, you know, why do you even care? You're going to be dead in five years. You'll never see the overpopulation. And I just responded to her and said, I know you're afraid. Don't believe the lies. Yeah. So you have to look behind the slap 
to turn the other cheek. It's not that God wants us to be hit again. You have to say, what's really going on in this person's life? Mm-hmm. And we don't answer according to our culture. We answer according to the kingdom, which means we are ambassadors of a king. And that means I got to actually respond the way Jesus would want me to respond. And he loves people. He loves frightened people. He loves people that are captive. He loves people that are listening to lies. He loves people that have been wounded by the church. You know, and I just find humility is something that is lacking in the body of Christ. And I think it would go a a really long way. I mean, the Bible says, agree with your adversary. So let's say, Leah, if somebody says to me, Lisa, you could be more loving. I'm going to be like, that is 100% true. Mm -hmm. I bet I could always grow in love. So, you know, how, how can I do that? And I think we also have to be really careful that we allow our critics to refine us, but not define us. Mm -hmm. They are not allowed to identify us. My identity is who I am in God. Critics, if I'm saying something unclear, I can be clearer. And I can, I can understand that social media is like, I'm letting someone into my home as a guest. And if they behave badly, I can, I can restrict them because everybody has a bad day. If they're behaving in a way that is detrimental to other people, I'm going to block them. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Now we do live in a a culture that where we are so fearful. You mentioned fear. Yeah. There's just so much going on. We talked earlier about how hard it is to be a parent right now with, with some of the ideologies that are, are put forward. Mm -hmm. How can understanding God's love for us mitigate some of this fear that we just have every single day? Yes. Well, I have learned that fear is a horrible counselor. And so I don't want to listen to fear. I want to say, okay, if I'm going to have a fear response, I'm going to react instead of respond. So what is the intentional response? Like, okay. So if we're afraid for our children, one of the best things we can do for our kids is empower them, not hide them. Uh, years and years ago, I wrote a book called Kiss the Girls Who Made Them Cry. And I, I talked about um, navigating our sexuality and I compared it to Sleeping Beauty. And I talked about in the parable of Sleeping Beauty, there's this king and the queen and they hear that their daughter's going to prick her finger on a spinning wheel, you know, uh, what are the spindle? And they think, okay, that's it. We're going to make spinning wheels illegal. They, you know, they burn them all. They think they've got all of them burnt and taken care of, but they hide one away and she pricks her finger on it. How much more powerful would it have been if they had trained her to be skillful? Mm -hmm. And I think we don't train our kids to be skillful. We, we think, okay, we're going to think for them because my my boys, you know, thank God I've got four boys who love God with all of their heart. They're doing a better job raising their children than John and I did. But what we did is we understood that our kids, I mean, like everybody's parents, ah, you know, my parents might be right. They might not be right. My parents aren't cool. So we would actually bring other people into conversations. I would play different <clears throat> video clips of different think leaders or thought leaders for my boys around the dinner table. And then we'd say, well, what do you think about that? Mm-hmm. And we would have conversations. And so one of the highest rated things to make a child feel secure and healthy is eating dinner as a family. But you don't just eat, you discuss, you linger, you have conversations, you don't shut your kids down. You, you know, you ask things. I I remember asking, you know, again, different days. I mean, this was a long time ago. Uh, I remember hearing something about, you know, young kids in junior high being very sexually active. And I just was folding laundry. So my head would be down. So my kids couldn't see my reaction. And I asked my one son, Hey, I heard this today. Is, Is this true? And he was like, yes. And I just did not react. I just said, well, how is that making you feel? And, you know, he told me some different things and different things that he had been called because he wasn't involved in this, you know, and just like, okay, you know, well, let's talk about this. So we have to open communication and then we have to not shame them 
when they ask questions or if they've gotten involved in something, you know, I, I still feel like parents, they don't understand how much power they have to navigate things. Um, so, you know, I don't think hiding our kids or hiding our children from certain influences is a good thing in a long term. Yes, when they're five, you know, but as they as they become into teenagers, there's conversations. And again, the motivation always has to be love. Mm -hmm. Love, you know, because love, love looks for ways to rescue. Love will attack the stronghold, but not the person. And so we, you know, we look at the different ways to have those conversations with people. Lisa, we're almost out of time, but ultimately, what is your hope for Fiercely Loved? I hope that as women turn each page, they have an experience with God's love for them. I hope it, it chips away at every stronghold of lies that says that they're less than, that says that God will love them when they're like this. And, and I hope that love will begin to make them who they were always created to be. And it will just open their eyes to the wonder of a God who is love, not a God who has love, but a God who is love. And um, just, uh, just love them into a place of wholeness. I love that. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I love talking to you, love hearing you speak and all your wisdom. No. Yeah. It's, it's been a long time coming. I've made a lot of mistakes, so, but I've been married 40 years this year. Is that crazy? Wow. Congratulations. So, thank you. So I am hoping that people can learn how to love well, because when you love well, you live well.